Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Series 12 of the Plant-Based Podcast is sponsored by People, Plants, Wellbeing. This is the place where you can find your magic through the power of plants and nature. Relax at a nature immersive retreat, wellness day, forest bathing walk, or why not contact the studio about a tailored team day for your work colleagues' well-being. Later in the episode, we'll be giving you an exclusive discount code for all podcast listeners, and this can be used for money off people, plants, well-being services. Find out more about Nature-Based Wellbeing Studio at peopleplantswellbeing.com or on Instagram under People Plants Wellbeing. So gardening as therapy has become way more recognized in recent years and being able to get outside into the garden really is a lifeline for so many. Um, And this is something today's guest, Callie Hamilton Stove, recognized and then founded the Glass House Project, bringing plants to prisons to educate, inspire and rehabilitate women in the disused prison glass houses. Now a thriving social enterprise, Callie is here to tell us more. Welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Ah, I think it's a really, really unique subject that we've got today. But first of all, let's kick off by just tell tell us about you. What is your background? Is it in horticulture? And and what kind of gave birth to this whole amazing project? Um, So my background is actually in marketing and communications. And I worked in Mm -hmm. um, kind of agency work for ages. I left um, probably about eight years ago now. And I started my own consulting business because I wanted... I'd always worked in kind of charity and education, and I wanted to start doing more social work, more kind of social focused work. And so I did a bit of um, social consulting on sustainability and and sourcing um, products that were more sustainable. And I love that work. I really enjoyed it. But um, I kind of got pulled into a few different directions after that. And one of them was a friend of mine had been uh, working at the prison and they were really struggling to um, kind of to, to help women who were leaving prison find housing and employment. Those were the two main mm-hmm. challenges the prison was, was facing. And those are the two main causes of reoffending. And mm-hmm. she also, whilst at the prison, had noticed they had all these facilities that weren't being used. And some of those were not being used fully and some of those were the glass houses they had these old glass houses that were part of the original um kind of agricultural program that would have been going on at the prison but those programs got cut quite a lot i think in the 80s and 90s and so now they just had um quite a lot of facilities that weren't being used and she said is there not a way to like look at those facilities and address some of the problems they're facing, some of these issues. And I um, have always been a massive houseplant person, as is my friend who mm-hmm. we I founded this this um, project with. And we thought there's got to be something with it because it's so healthy to have them around. It's so good to be working with them. And it, it's so, you know, has so many amazing benefits. So is there any way to capture that? in the prison with the women and address that employment and opportunity for the future as well. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of research on um, horticultural industry and what, what was needed, what was trending, what people liked. And we came across the um, office installation and maintenance service. And it really appealed to us because we really believe in the biophilic principles of people being around nature, making their life healthier and happier and more um, fulfilled and just feeling good. And so we mm-hmm. thought we believe that plants in the office are a good thing, that that makes a difference to people, that that benefits them. And if we can get those into the glass houses in prison, grow and nurture them and train the women in how to take care of them and then how to maintain them in that environment, that's a job opportunity for them. 
So that's mm-hmm. kind of how it started originally, was really thinking about taking a horticultural industry and bringing it into the prison to address an issue. Mm-hmm. And has it okay. ever been done before or anything like mm. this ever been done before? I mean, not really. Some companies work within the prison really well. Um, they take women out on day release for work like Timpsons. Um, and, and, and there are a lot, and Sainsbury's hires women from the prison as well to work in their shops and gives them good opportunities to work in the, in their grocery mm-hmm. stores. But, um, but actually doing it this way where you're actually really integrating into, um, kind of the prison as much as possible mm-hmm. whilst they're still in prison and mm-hmm. really then looking at a, a opportunity afterwards and especially in horticulture, horticulture. it's never been known mm-hmm. that I know of now. Yeah, that's really amazing. You know, and also the way I see it is that absolutely everyone has a right to nature, whether that's houseplants, outdoor plants, forest and woodland, plants on your desk. Absolutely everyone should be able to have that access and, um, and, you know, the the rewards of being around plants, you know, whether that's mental, social, physical, Mm -hmm. everyone should have that right. Yeah, I think one of the things that we do um, in the prison, in all the prisons we work in, um, is we do a training course where we um, we can, anybody can come, not just the women who work with us, but they come and they, you know, and a lot of times they don't really want to come, they're kind of made to come, but they, you know, we usually have, you know, a bunch of women, a mix of mixed experiences with nature or plants, and they kind of get their hands dirty. We show them how to make compost for indoor plants and then Mm -hmm. we do a lot of propagation obviously and they get to to take some of the plants we propagated and put them in a new pod and maybe propagate from it we're just kind of working with the plants with them and teaching them about how the plants work how to care for them and then they get to take them back to their room in prison Mm -hmm. and a lot of them have never had a plant have never really thought about having a plant we get the feedback we get from that one little plant that they get to have in their room and taking Mm -hmm. care of it is is just it's so amazing that just such a little thing can make such a big difference. Mm. Oh, I totally and utterly, you know, I just like one plant can make such a big difference. And I think when you're looking after plants, even if it's just one in your room, it gives you responsibility. It gives you a bit mm-hmm. of hope, doesn't it, for the future? Mm. And also it, it helps you to see kind of like the cycle of life, you know, how Absolutely. things work, you know, mm. and that different people need different things like different plants need different have different requirements yeah. to flourish that kind of thing mm-hmm. so I, I think this is really lovely I'm, I'm like how many prisons do you work in at the moment so at, at the moment we are um in two doing training and we're just starting the third so we've just um kind of in the in the wet in the starting in down view which is a bit slower the problem is the prison we started in is an open prison so which means that women can go out on day release after they're approved and that's really where we work best is in an open environment where women, we can bring them out and we can give them experiences outside of the prison to start getting them ready to move back into society. Now, the MOJ, the Ministry of Justice, has said that that is the number one way to decrease reoffending, that go, ha, giving prisoners a chance to like have a bit of a soft landing and whilst they're still in the system, be going out and working and having experiences in the community is a really good you know, amazing way Mm -hmm. to make sure they have a good chance of success, but it's Mm -hmm. really slow to change the prison system. So not all prisons have a day release program quite yet. Mm -hmm. So um, SEND in Surrey is growing their day release program. So we're starting to work with them and hopefully Downview will be doing that as well. There's only two open women's prisons in the UK. One is outside of Leeds and one is here in Kent. So Mm -hmm. but our, our objective in the next kind of five to 10 years is to be in every women's prison. Okay. Amazing. I find this so intriguing. I just want to ask a few questions on a practical level. So, like, uh, uh, how can you access the prison? Is there, like, some security requirements for you to then be on site? How does that kind of end of it all work, please? So, that's a good question. My um, So, I so the open prison is a little bit easier than the closed prisons. I, I during one of the things that happened when we when MOJ approved our proposal to them in 2019, and that happened right before COVID started. So we went into the open prison pretty quickly after that and started our first cohort, and then COVID kicked in. And luckily, we were already there, so we actually got to stay. And because the glass house were, were considered outside, we got to keep working all the way through COVID. Obviously, mm-hmm. there were no office plants to install. So we started doing smaller plants, which is how our web shop and our shop started, as we started really working with smaller plants rather than just the bigger Mm -hmm. office plants. But anyway, the point is, I didn't have a problem at that point getting into prisons, and 
and um, working within that open environment. And that basically, um, I mean, obviously it's still very tight security. We had, I usually always had a guard or an officer with me mm, who was mm. usually working with me. And I usually had one who was also kind of interested in horticulture. So it worked really well. But now as we've grown, I've hired people that have a lot more experience in the prison system and they can draw keys. They have a lot more training than I do to actually work within that environment. And they mm-hmm. can now go in and have a lot more freedom within the prisons to train and to be present with the women um, working on site. We actually, mm-hmm. um, Last year, though, we moved uh, most of our, our training and growing facility outside of prison. And part of that was the cost of electricity to run the glass houses. Um, mm-hmm. It just went up so high. And they're not like amazingly you know, <laughs> efficient facilities. And so last winter, we had to move mm-hmm. to kind of maintain them in a different facility. So just outside the prison, not far. And all the women come out and work in our facility from there. Mm-hmm. Hi everyone, it's Kirsty here from My Little Allotment and you're joining me on My Allotment today. I'm going to give you a little bit of an update. Now, July has been very, very rainy and it hasn't really been that warm, to be honest. So the veg patch is sort of hit and miss. Some things are still doing great. Other things, however, are not very happy. So I'm going to start with the French beans and the runner beans now. They are looking fabulous and are ready to be picked. And you could probably pick them every other day. There's that many of them. So that's amazing. And they look so green and luscious and healthy. The courgettes are thriving like normal. They seem to cope no matter what. And the tomatoes in the greenhouse are doing okay. They're all just starting to ripen now. So I'm just making sure that I'm definitely feeding them once a week and removing those lower branches and pinching them out. Now, a few things that aren't doing as well as normal is um, my fruit. So I've had a bit of a rubbish time this year with my strawberries, my cherry tree and my plum tree. I feel like they've just been really sad and a bit unhappy and I'm going to put it down to the rubbish spring and I think if anything goes wrong this year (laughs) I'm going to put it down to that. The dahlia patch however is just starting to come to life. There are some dahlias starting to open so you want to obviously keep them blooming as much as you can until the first frost arrives which sometimes can be all the way till like the end of October start of November here in Lincoln and you want to make sure you're deadheading them regularly and giving them a feed once a week and they will just produce blooms into the autumn which is really nice Um, I love that you get to see them all the way through to the autumn time I do also now have some pumpkins growing. Now, pumpkins and squash are my favourite thing to grow. There are so many varieties out there and they're really easy to grow from seed. They're really easy to plant out and they're really easy to sort of leave in the vegetable garden to just do as they please. And they're really great for getting kids involved in the garden like in the vegetable patch or on your allotment and they're just really fun and also the fact that you can harvest your pumpkins you can use them for decoration at halloween you can eat them um and you can they're so versatile and they're definitely something that everybody should be growing so yes i've got some pumpkins and squash starting to form on the vines and it's just very exciting I really love my allotment at this time of year but I have to say I really can't wait for the autumn to come because I really do love the big clean up. You obviously teach them about house plants, anything to do with grow your own fruit, veg and is it kind of like a lesson based or what format does it take on? So we have up to up to recently, we offered horticultural qualifications level one or level two. And so obviously within those qualifications, there's tons of modules that deal with lots of different planting, not just house plants. Often, you know, you would deal with growing vegetables or fruits, or you would deal with mm-hmm. pests, you would deal with, you know, a lot yeah. of different types of things. Um, also buying and, and sourcing and tons of things were involved in those modules and those qualifications. 
but we're just in the process of changing our qualification now because whilst that's a great qualification, we weren't finding that it was making them that much more marketable. And we really wanted to find a qualification that we could really um, target what we do, what we do with house mm-hmm. plants and what we do with um, with office plants. So we're working on that now and developing that. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll, we not, we're not sure whether that will be RHS or how we'll do that, but, um, but it will mean that they, they still finish with the qualification. I mean, we do tons of other pl- training as well. So we do the mm-hmm. horticultural training, but we'll also in line with that, we'll do lots of health and safety. We'll do communication. We'll do customer service. So there's tons of stuff mm-hmm. they're learning um, mm-hmm. through our training process in addition to just learning about growing and propagating. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, the women who have been on these, uh, on your program within the prisons, what what support do they get or what happens when they leave prison? Yeah. So um, we also have this amazing woman, head of social impact named Maria Love, who um, really has changed our program massively since she joined us. And she, basically from day one, every woman gets a resettlement plan. And that plan will address like whatever they need to make sure that they're successful when they're released from housing to employment, which are our main focuses, but also like if they need to get their children out of care, if they need legal support, mm-hmm. if they have like physical or mental needs or, you know, anything that comes up, she is kind of the person that they, she creates that plan with them and they try to address that in um, the year or so they're with us. And then, so when they were released, they kind of, that care continues as long as they need really. But we have quite um, a good alumni program, I call it. And that's where we kind of stay in touch with them. We make sure they have what they need. We had one woman actually just today who she left about a year and a half ago. She's amazing. I love her story so much. She basically um, didn't have anywhere to go when she was leaving prison and she didn't want to go back where she was from because um, Mm -hmm. a lot of the people that she'd been with were kind of involved in the kind of the Mm. crime she'd done and she just didn't want to go back there. But the prison system had, had, I had put her with a probation person there. And so she kind of was being kind of made to go back there and she didn't really have a lot of options. So Mm -hmm. basically we took on, she joined us and we started looking at it quite quickly. And she said that she was more interested in the hard landscaping kind of element of of what we were doing. So we got her lots of qualifications, HS1 and HS2, and we managed to get her a job at a construction site or we didn't, she did, she did all of this actually. She got a job Mm -hmm. at at a construction site in Lewisham and because she had a job, the prison system reassigned her probation officer and she went there and she started a whole new life. And last week we heard from her and we hear from them regularly, but she called and said, if she just got a promotion, she was dating one of the managers in the business. They wanted to go on holiday. She'd never had a passport before. Could we sign for her passport to get her passport oh, so and you know, so, you know things like that oh. so, you know, her life really oh. I think she lived a very different life now than she did and so that support we definitely sure will sign for her you know her help her get her passport so she can go on holiday and oh yeah you know, that's those are the kinds oh. of things that are really nice so we definitely continue the support after they leave we're really oh. here for them we've helped people um, get driver's license and all kinds of things they need afterwards I, I know, just before we move on, I just also wonder. Obviously, the qualifications and experience they're getting is um, mm. within horti- within horticulture. How have you found the horticultural industry to be um, when it comes to mm. employing them or giving them opportunity when they leave prison? Yeah, good um, question. Yeah, I would say amazing. Actually, I think um, mm-hmm. I think generally people that I we've met in the horticulture industry are so supportive. And really understand what we're doing. They understand the benefits of, um, you know, working in with plants and nature and being there. And so I found that um, not only the industry that we primarily work in, which is that office installation and maintenance, we have really good relationships with all the big companies that do that, like around the country, because we obviously can't service places in Manchester or you know, Leeds or Bristol. Mm-hmm. And so the, those companies actually guarantee our women an interview because of their training. They're really happy to make to offer them a job or at least give them an interview. And also a lot of, one of our women went back to Wales and she wanted to kind of start her own growing. She wanted, she wanted, she bought some poly, poly tunnels and rented a little piece of land and started her own mm-hmm. growing. And people were so <laughs> supportive of her. You know, the local garden centers and the local community was really supportive of that. So mm, I think um so I think cool. generally it's a very supportive industry. I really think that's <laughs> definitely one of the reasons 
I think that this works actually is because people get it. People get that, you know, yeah, there's this like yeah. cycle well, people going need on. that chance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what would you say, uh, are you going to expand this to more prisons or how would you possibly extend the program? What's in the future for Glass House Project? Well, we, we'd really like to be national. So well, that we plan mm-hmm. to be national. So we're going to hopefully um, expand extend to these two prisons in this year and then probably at least one or two others the following year and then after we kind of get the that how it takes a while it's it's slow kind of getting into prisons it's not a fast process so i would say you know we have to usually have to work about a year before we're really ingrained and can start really taking women out and doing mm-hmm. the work we really want to do with them so we probably two prisons a year i figure there's about um probably take us about five years to get into all the prisons in the uk and then we'll have hopefully almost like a franchise but not where we'll have like little mm-hmm. local hubs around the country where the women can come out and work and we can service our clients and we can sell our plants and our shops um so this mm-hmm. year we are planning on opening a london branch later this year mm-hmm. so cool and that'll wow. be our first yeah Already. That sounds amazing, and like you know, wish you all the best for doing that for sure. I think <laughs> it's such a great initiative. Um, I have you. to just ask if you have any more stories, you know, some any more inspiring stories of women that have left. I know you've already mentioned one or two, but is there anything yeah. that's really kind of got you, you know, where you'll it will never leave you because you know it's been so special? Yeah, you know, there's so many actually, but I think, um, I think the the one woman that we had had been in prison since she was 14 she went in as a young offender and she'd you know been homeless at that time she kind of been in a really bad kind of environment you know not a lot of healthy stuff going on in her life and so something Mm -hmm. bad happened and she ended up in prison and um came to us um a few years about two years ago i guess and we tried we started working with her when we were working in the glass houses in the prison about two years ago and she she we she automatically took to it it was amazing how quickly she took to being in there with the plants and you could see the change like when she would be in the glass houses working with the plants and then once she stepped out you could see her kind of back rise again you know she'd been in the in the system for so long you know it's quite hard to and it's a hard environment there's a lot of politics there's a lot of you know women in one big building all together it can lead to, you know, there was a lot of, it was, you had to be tough. And so her toughness would come back as soon as she stepped out of the glass house. But in the glass house, you could see her soften and you could see her. And and the longer we worked with her and the longer we got to know her, the more that softness kind of extended itself and extended itself. And um, and she'd already had a couple shots at going on probation and a couple of shots odds of getting out and they just hadn't worked and i think part of it was really that kind of that like kind of wall she'd built up and i think last year actually it kind of started to happen last year really earlier this year um she went she found out she was up for probation again and she was so excited she felt like it was time she's 27 now and she really she's mm-hmm. like it's got to be time now and um we just worked with her a lot in the run-up to that because we just felt like being with the plants and working with us really allowed her to separate herself from that system that she'd been in Mm -hmm. and from all the toughness she needed to have at the front of her. And um, we kind of worked with her a little bit on her language and how she presented herself and what her plans Mm -hmm. were. And we really put together a really tight plan of where she was going to go and what she wanted to do. And, um, and she got probation and she's actually, she's been out a few months now. And it's just amazing like talking to her and hearing her and she took and she has so many plants she's filled her little kind of her she's in assisted housing she's filled it with plants and she says she said it's changed her life you know she i don't know if she'll work in plants because i'm not sure she's that way inclined but she says they'll she will Mm. always have plants and they will always be a massive part of her life and i think she really feels like they kind of helped her kind of get to that point where she was ready to leave prison Mm. yeah that's amazing once you love plants uh, you never stop (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, just no. just another example of the power of plants, isn't it? Yeah, yeah totally. Mm. <laughs> Where um, we could talk to you all day, and I'm sure you've got lots more examples of wonderful stories, but. We need to uh, start to wrap up. So where can people find out more about the project and maybe maybe even help out themselves somehow? Yeah, well, you can buy plants Mm. on our website Mm -hmm. and and every single plant represents a second chance. We're really particular Mm -hmm. um, about our plants. They come out, 
They're beautiful. They're like hand potted and specially designed compost for that plant. And they're put it, we put them in these really beautiful handmade gray clay pots and they come with a mm -hmm. tray to match because we don't want our plants to stain furniture or floors. And so they're really beautifully presented. Our women, they pot them, they pack them, they ship them, they do everything themselves. So when you get a plant from us, you know that that actually has given yeah. someone training and work and a second chance. And so buying from our website, which is www.theglasshouse.co.uk is a great thing to do. We also do workshops. So if anybody wants to come and learn about potting from our women, they love to share their knowledge and experience wow. that really be, builds their confidence. So that's always on offer. So, but we just love to Amazing. hear people. We're always, always happy to hear from people on our, from our website. So Amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone yeah. listening, go and check the Glasshouse project out for sure. I mean, I've got to say, most people who are listening to this podcast are going to be plant lovers and most likely have lots of house plants. And there's always room for one more, right? So go and check out the Glasshouse project. Squeeze <laughs> in the more house plants. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, and thank you. All hearing about all the amazing work that you do, I wish you all the best for the coming years as well. Getting thank it in you. all prisons because, you know, like Michael said. It really does show the power of plants. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's great talking to you guys. <laughs> thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Holland and I'm a freelance nature educator. I'm the author of the books I Ate Sunshine for Breakfast, Smart Animals and A Jungle in Your Living Room. I've recently written about 25 articles for Gardener's World Online and I'm on the RHS Education Committee and I love all aspects of the natural world and how it links to our lives. A few years ago, and largely thanks to Michael, I had the pleasure and honour of being asked to go to Japan to give a selection of workshops and lectures. One of them is called Five Plants That Change the World, which I've been giving to gardening clubs ever since. One of the plants I feature in my talk, I'm going to share with you right now. It's the humble pea plant, Pissum sativum, whose cousins include clover, beans, lupins, lentils, tamarind, and even massive acacia trees, and more. It was once believed that anyone who ate peas on Good Friday would soon have a death in the family. In Germany, it was customary to eat mushy peas or pea soup at funeral meals and death watches. Special powers were given to peas that had been stuck into a skull, the head of a cat, snake, or woodlark, and then buried into the earth to germinate. These peas would make you invisible. They'd help you to recognise witches and understand the language of geese. Very useful. There are many more tales, beliefs and customs along these lines, but let's step back into reality and the realms of science, shall we? Seeds represent the most important development in the evolution of plants. A protective coat, a food store and genetic material, all in a little time capsule. Austrian monk... Gregor Mendel studied to prove recessive genes that skip a generation, giving us an early understanding of genetics. With a family farming background, Mendel started investigating breeding experiments with mice in 1843, but was asked to stop because of the smell. So he took it outside and began to grow edible peas instead. Through several experiments and generations, he found that characteristics such as pea colour and flower colour are inherited independently of one another, in pairs from each parent. In human terms, it's the reason why you might have your grandmother's nose, since these traits can skip a generation. He published his findings, which his peers took to be incomplete, and he died, accepting that his life's work was worthless. But later, other scientists found Mendel's work and brought to light its importance. This understanding of hidden traits and the nature of genes has changed our understanding of ourselves and our world forever. Additionally, peas, along with their siblings and cousins in the bean family, tend to have colonies of beneficial nitrogen-fixing bacteria living in knobbly root nodules, making them perfect plants to enrich the soil and one of the species useful in crop rotation and as a green manure. So there we are, the pea. Thanks for having me. Happy growing. Bye.
Hi everyone, all plant lovers out there, it's Ellen Mary here today. We are doing individual gossips for this week because Michael is off in Minneapolis in the US with Garden Com and Garden Centre magazine where he's doing talks about his journey in the world of gardening and garden tours and all kinds of, of amazing things. So um, he's a busy bee and on this side of the ocean, <laughs> I've been busy too and I really want to tell you about my visit to Mr. Fothergill's. So you've probably heard of Mr. Fothergill's. Uh, they sell seeds, you can find them online. They're a really well-known horticultural brand in the UK and overseas as well. Um, and they had uh, an open day today which was for um, some of us to go along and have a look at their trials field just meeting other people from the industry and it was a really good day and I wanted to tell you about it because some of the flowers I found in the trials gardens were so cool and it's really awesome to be able to see behind the scenes you know we buy the seeds and we go to the garden centers and we get to choose from what the garden centers have bought in and that's often influenced by what's used at the garden shows for example but where does it all begin you know how does it all start like how do the flowers get to the garden center so it's really really cool to see what goes on behind the scenes and this is all about seeds. So they trial seeds in their trials field, which is near Cambridge. It's Newmarket near Cambridge. And they trial them for years and they, they trial to make sure that the seeds they're growing actually grow with the characteristics that they are, you know, advertised as, as, as what they're, they're sold to them as. And... There's so much going on, you know, making sure that they're good for pollinators or looking at kind of colours that people are excited about, lots of kind of wild flowers. It's just really cool to see. And there's also grow your own. So this isn't just cut flowers, but there's cucumbers and courgettes and tomatoes, all kinds of things as well. Loads of herbs as well, which is really nice to see. And of course, at this time of year, the field was looking super colourful. So it was just full of cornflowers, like pink, blue, white, tons of calendula, or known as pot marigold, which isn't actually a marigold at all. But you'll know it as an orange daisy looking flower and a yellow daisy looking flower. But they're trialing ones that look sort of peachy and pinky as well, with numerous petals, but open for pollinators really really beautiful of course i love the marigolds tragedies because it's one of my favorites and when we were asked to look around and pick our favorite everybody walked past the marigolds so that's where i stopped of course because it's the underdog if you like <laughs> but marigolds love them or hate them are amazing companion plants for if you're growing your own food and they remind me so much of my uncle and my uncle got me into gardening when I was young, he used to plant loads of them for his organic kitchen garden. So I love seeing marigolds. But they were trialing loads of different varieties. Just loads of different shapes, textures, fragrances, um, colours. Just really beautiful. So I spent some time looking around those. And you will see a reel about that very soon, including the names of um, the new varieties that will soon be coming to market that you will be able to pick up in a garden centre or nursery next year or the year after, hopefully. So check out my reels at Ella Mary Gardening. So yeah, it's a really cool day. And then we also made like a flower pot and we also made cocktails as well. Yeah, garden cocktails, which was really, really cool. And it's lovely to see people from the industry. So a big thank you to Mr. Fothergills for inviting me along to the day. It was really nice. And can you believe it? The rain stayed away. Can you believe that for a whole day? I mean, I, I mean, I can't remember the last time that happened. <laughs> I know we always talk about the weather in Britain, don't we? But I think we're allowed because it's so variable. You never really know where you're at, do you? Imagine how the plants feel. <laughs> They have no idea what's going on. I think it's autumn, probably. Anyway, I really hope that you're 
gardening journey is going really well. Um, I know it's been tough out there in the garden this year with a really hot, scorching, dry June and then a really wet, grey July. It's uh, pretty tough. But every single year, you know, us gardeners tackle something a little bit different and that's what's happening this year. Um, but yes, thanks, uh, Mr. Father Girls. Uh, thanks for Mother Nature to keeping for keeping the rain away from us for a day. <laughs> Do go and check them out um, and uh, see what seeds they've got and keep checking over the next year or two because there are some really cool varieties coming. So that's what I've been up to apart from that weeding the allotment mostly, <laughs> as is most of us been doing, I think, at this time of year. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed the episode so far and we will be back next week. Uh, after you've heard from Michael uh, right now about his trip to the US and uh, we'll be back very soon bye plant lovers happy gardening hey guys it's Michael here Ellen and I are doing separate gossips this week because I'm in America and we couldn't possibly fix up a time to talk together because it was uh, far too complex. And I'm here at a conference, uh, two different conferences, actually. And so it was really, really hard to find a time. So you're going to have to deal with us one by one. Don't know if that makes it better or worse. Anyway, uh, full of jet lag, but kind of surviving on coffee, which is uh, obviously what a lot of people do in America anyway, which is fab. I love that. But um, let me talk to you about my um, days. I might do a couple of um, little recordings here because I'm kind of in the middle of the whole um, sessions at the moment, but just got a few minutes in my hotel room, just had a beautiful breakfast sandwich with lovely ketchup. There's something about the ketchup in the US. It's kind of vinegary but I really enjoy it. So yeah, really fun. Anyway, uh, I had a great day with the Garden Center Expo this week because I'm here speaking for them, but also speaking for Garden Com, which is the Garden Media Guild of the US, that type of thing. So I was signed up to a Garden Center tour uh, the first day after I arrived. Uh, it was so cool, honestly. We went to a place called Tonkadale, Tangletown and Buckman. It's really cool. They're like uh, uh, cartoon names, aren't they? Anyway, let me tell you about those. Uh, Tonkadale was beautiful. Uh, first of all, let me talk about the coffee. Um, they had coffee in big cartons, big hot cartons. Honestly, they're mad for coffee here. They really are. Anyway, Tonkadale, excellent garden centre, really nicely laid out, amazing houseplant section. I really wanted to take some of those things home. It was incredible. Uh, container sections where they make up seasonal containers for customers. Uh, excellent outdoor section. So many echinacea. You can't even imagine. Fragrant, double. Oh, they grow so many more than we do. I don't know if we've got it warm enough to keep them happy, but it was amazing. Pineapple plants, but real pineapples not your pygmy pineapple real pineapples oh my god it was so cool even the toilets were beautiful it was an amazing place they had aurelia sun king as well which is a plant you may or may not know actually glows in the dark look it up you'll love it so tangletown was our next one this is uh run by a couple of guys called dean and scott and they have the most amazing vergers. Have a look on my Instagram and you will see how incredible they are. They're multi-planted. In the US, they're not like, we're sometimes really plant snobs. We don't like bright colors. We don't like gold. We don't like this, that, la, 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 la. But in US, they plant all the colors and it is amazing. Honestly, gold, silvers, reds, blues. It's just unashamed and the result is really so uplifting all the textures as well. These vergers, I'm looking at the pictures now, there's, oh, what, what even is that? Like a Penicetum, Cosmos, Gonfrena, Cyperus. Oh my gosh, it was so cool. But this Tangletown is very small. It's kind of like an inner city garden center, but it's kind of an English style house with English tiles as well. Very, very cool. And they had some really cool plants as well. Uh, they had some ace begonias, begonia rex types. Uh, Lynn from Dibley's would love that. Also the coleus, amazing range of coleus. And in this garden centre, they were using um, paper pulp patio containers as well, which was very interesting because we're only just starting to get into that in uh, in Europe because you've got Dopa from Martin Leckerkirk. 
he's bringing them in from the Netherlands. So it's really, we seem to be up behind the US with, with this. Uh, what else was there? Oh my God, a really beautiful cafe next door. In 24 hours, I had two amazing kale salads. That's right up my boulevard. Uh, anyway, we were then at uh, the last stop for the day, which was Bachmann. Uh, they have a lovely cafe called Patrick's. Um, I, li- I don't mind the American coffee, really nice, but I was kind of aching for something a little bit shorter. So I attempted to order a Cortado at uh, Patrick's and... I, uh, well, I had to explain it to the to the girl, but I, she still didn't get it. So I ordered the components. So I ordered a double espresso and some hot milk, and I made it myself. So hopefully, I educated them along the way. Uh, Buckman was really cool. So jealous of their caladiums. Oh my gosh, their alacasias, their hemicallis. This climate, even though it's so cold here in the winter, in the summer, it's really warm. And oh, the Caladiums love the little bit of humidity this here as well. We also spotted, we had a lovely tour and a merchant, merchandising kind of preview as well. There was a fridge with beneficial insects inside. And there was tubs of ladybirds. How cool is that, honestly? Uh, then... Uh, Back to the hotel, picked up my goodie bag, ready for Garden Com events as well, because the events are both in the same hotel on different floors. So I'm kind of shuttling between each of them, not just speaking at both events, but also attending different talks, because there was an amazing one about AI this morning, which was very eye-opening too. Excellent quality of presentations here. I really, really have to credit Garden Com for what they've put together and, and also the Garden Centre Expo, which I can't wait to go around the hall tomorrow as well and I'll report back to you guys too. Uh, we had an early morning uh, photo shoot today although I, I was a bit confused because it was worded as a photo shoot on the schedule and I thought this meant that like they would take pictures of us so I dressed up like really nicely <laughs> but it was actually like meaning that we would take pictures of the gardens. <laughs> so get over yourself Michael. <laughs> it was so cool. It was at the Como Conservatory and, oh, my God, amazing native planting. The water garden was insane. Oh, my God, beautiful water lilies. But not just that. They were growing plants kind of uh, in pots in the water, kind of raised up a little bit. And they have canners, which obviously are very happy in that natural environment. But also, this blew my mind. I have to look it up. They had mimosa, pudica, the sensitive plant, growing in the water. I have to look up if there's an aquatic type. They also had talbagia. Zephyranthus, all growing in this environment. It was so cool, honestly. Anyway, uh, I'm going to sign off here because I've got another day and a half and I then want to do a separate gossip so I make sure I tell you everything about my little experience here. The goodie bag is fun as well. We get a Plant Geek uh, water bottle, Plant Geek hat. Of course, they're right at my boulevard from Proven Winners. But also, Endless Summer... um, what do you call this? Like a beer collar? Uh, they were popular in Australia. I, I don't know what they're called. And a, and a can opener as well. So really, really cool. Obviously catering to people that drink beer or water. So there you go. Anyway, I will catch you very, very soon. Well, just after this jingle, actually. Bye-bye. Oh, guys, I don't even know what way up I am, but I'm having such a brilliant week. Um, I've just got 50 minutes until I need to get ready for the awards night tonight. Uh, Wish me luck because uh, I could potentially win uh, an award. So um, I'm in the shortlist for website and for book as well. Oh, my gosh. Okay, uh, so back to business. What do I need to tell you about? Where did I leave off? I think it was when we went to the conservatory and it was... uh, not a photo shoot of me, it was a photo shoot of plants. That was it, wasn't it? Uh, after this, um, I was doing my presentations, presentation in American language. Uh, it was really good. Garden Centre Expo one was great. I said fart three times and sh- once, which was really, really good strike rate. So that's very cool. Um, what else happened? I then did another presentation for Garden Com the next day, which was sort of like an interview, almost like this is your lifestyle with the with the big boss Maria. So that was pretty fun as well. Um, and then I attended lots of other presentations and really, really cool stuff, I have to say. Talking about AI, the chocolate botanist uh, was talking about 
uh, misinformation in the age of influencer, which was quite eye-opening as well. Uh, there was various kind of social media, different marketing presentations, discussions, panels, different drinks, events. Oh my God, it's a whirlwind. It is an absolutely fantastic event. Garden Centre Expo is on level three of the hotel. Garden Com is on level two. And you're kind of really knee deep in all this amazing horticulture, which is just incredible. And then today, I've been on garden tours, which were brilliant. Oh my gosh, let me tell you all about it. We went to an amazing kind of country, kind of suburban home with the most incredible shade garden. Really inspiring. So many different hostas. I know um, we can't grow hostas easily in the UK. It's slugs and snails that get them. But in the US, it's actually deer that get them. So I'm a slightly bigger predator than a slug or a snail. Um, it was just brilliant. 50 shades of green, so much texture. Really, really, you've got to look at my Instagram because so much in inspiration for a shady corner which was really really useful lots of take homes there uh, we also went to Cita Fork she's a really big Instagrammer lovely lovely edible gardens um, I saw sesame plants peanut plants uh, what else? Amazing squash, bean arches. Oh, really, really inspiring. Then Heidi Highland, her garden is kind of that edimental style that we saw at Hampton Court with Tom Massey, um, mixing up lots of different categories of plants. So there was Berberis alongside cabbages, alongside goji berries, really kind of blurring all the boundaries, my favourite sort of stuff. And using kind of native weeds to reduce runoff, lots of really clever environmental kind of aspects to that garden as well. Uh, in the morning, we were at Tangletown again, which I'd also been to on the Garden Centre tour. That was cool. Uh, great inspiration, that lovely suburban site there. Uh, where else? Ooh. Oh, the Arboretum. Minnesota Arboretum was great. Lots of very interesting edible take-homes as well. Like, uh, uh, what was it? A kind of flowering lawn? Bee lawns? That's what they call them. And they were doing some kind of lawns almost made of like strawberries and very low-growing kind of edible plants as well. Really, really interesting stuff. Uh, also, wandering around. Oh my God, the daylily garden. Oh, the lilies. They're really mad on martigan lilies here, which are beautiful as well. So much high resolution color. It just kind of really makes me think that we are so snobby about plants in the UK sometimes because here they just they just go with the color. I think it's brilliant. And I absolutely love it. So, wish me luck for the awards tonight. Uh, tomorrow we're seeing some more gardens, so I won't be uh, checking in with you guys with any more gossip, so that is your lot. But make sure you follow me on Instagram if you do not already, and you will see all of these wonderful pictures. Bye for now. Series 12 of the Plant-Based Podcast is sponsored by People Plants Wellbeing, the nature-based wellness studio where you can find your magic through the power of plants and nature. Take 10% off all services, treatments and retreats with our exclusive discount code for you, our podcast listeners. Use code PBP Series 12 via the website or when you contact the team to book. Next wellness days are coming up soon. Find out more and book your place at peopleplantswellbeing.com or on Instagram at peopleplantswellbeing. The music for the Plant Based Podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James and our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. 